Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is a series on First and Second Peter, entitled Feed My Sheep. And this particular lesson is lesson number 11 in that series, entitled False Teachers. This is the lesson for June 10 of 2017. And before we jump into it, we'd like to ask you, along with us, to bow your head and let's ask the Lord to give us guidance. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for the ways in which you guide us. And now as we come, we're coming to the end of the book of Second Peter, in this series we recognize that Peter is giving some final serious warnings to people, primarily people uh, in his day and following all the way up to the end of the world. May we learn from these lessons and may we take the warning seriously as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What kind of false teachers do you suppose there were in the, in the church in Peter's and Paul's day? I mean, don't we think about that church that's pictured in Revelation uh, as the first church, the church of Ephesus? We think those are the pure people, right? The ones who had everything right? Well, we need to remember, of course, that even among the disciples there was a traitor, wasn't there? Um, apparently, whatever those false teachings were, Peter felt pretty strongly about them because he has some pretty potent language to, to discuss these false teachers and their, and their teachings. Um, they included idea, and it, and it seems to be pretty clear that whatever it was, it was a way of mixing up uh, ideas from their former lives with their new lives in, in, as Christians. And the idea that, that somehow or other you, you didn't really need to be all the way a Christian, you could sort of mix in some of your old habits and so forth with your new Christianity. Uh, that seems to be the sort of feel we get for what Peter is saying here. Some people in some contexts would call it cheap grace. Um, there are a lot of strange teachings in our day, all the way from theistic to evolution to who knows what, um, where people are trying to, to somehow merge teachings from the world with the teachings of the scriptures and of the, of the church. Um, and what is the result of that? Well, um, I think of the disgrace that's come upon the Catholic Church in recent years because of people uh, slipping back into their worldly habits. Um, and then I, I come to this quotation from Ellen White, which is um, maybe a little shocking even. We have far more to fear from within than from without. The hindrances to strength and success are far greater from the church itself than from the world. Why would she say that? Unbelievers have a right to expect that those who profess to be keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus will do more than any other class to promote and honor by their consistent lives, by their godly example and their active influence the cause which they represent. But how often have the professed advocates of the truth proved the greatest obstacle to its advancement? The unbelief indulged, the doubts expressed, the darkness cherished, encourage the presence of evil angels and open the way for the accomplishment of Satan's devices. Review and Herald, March 22, 1887. That's a pretty serious wording there. Um, how do you feel about that? Did she have any, was there any context to that? I mean, was the rest of the well, article, did it talk about anything specific? Um, I didn't go back and read the whole article. I can tell you that this was written from um, Europe, probably from Switzerland. Um, and the church there was a little developing a little differently than it was here in the United States. Um, I don't know if that's a factor or not. We know from Second Thessalonians that Satan will work with all power and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness 
And of course, we all know about Matthew 24, where Jesus says there's going to be false Christs and false prophets, and they would deceive, if possible, the very elect. So, his working, Satan's working, is plainly revealed by the rapidly increasing darkness, the multitudinous errors, heresies, and delusions of these last days. Not only is Satan leading the world captive, but his deceptions are leavening the professed churches of our Lord Jesus Christ. The great apostasy will develop into darkness deep as midnight, impenetrable as sackcloth of hair. To God's people it will be a night of trial, a night of weeping, a night of persecution for the truth's sake. But out of that night of darkness, God's light will shine. And that's Christ's object lessons, 1905. Well, can we think of any times when there were maybe some problems within the Adventist church? Or we just always have been pure and holy? And have we ever been pure and holy? If we had ever been pure and holy, we would be in the kingdom, wouldn't we? Yes. Well, I think particularly, and we're going to be studying more about that next quarter when we talk about the book of Galatians, what happened at the Minneapolis General Conference in 1888. And if you want to read a little bit about that, you can go to volume one of the, or book one of Selected Messages, page 233 to 235. But let's, let's go back to Second Peter now. We're focusing on the yeah, second as, chapter. As far as the, we have more to fear from within than from without, you know, that was certainly the, true for the early church. You know, there was a time of persecution when they were pure. Mm -hmm. And then they merged with government the church merged with government and all sorts of heresy crept in. Yeah. Exactly right. Fake news. Fake news, it is. Yeah. Well, false prophets appeared in the past among the people, and in the same way, false teachers will appear among you. He doesn't say may, will appear. They will bring in destructive, untrue doctrines and will deny the master who redeemed them, so they will bring upon themselves sudden destruction. Even so, many will follow their immoral ways. This is one of the clues about, and because of what they do, others will speak evil of the way of truth. In their greed, these false teachers will make a profit out of telling you made-up stories. For a long time now, the, their judge has been ready and their destroyer has been wide awake. So does that give you some clues maybe about what kind of problems we, got, we have coming? I, uh, I find it very useful when talking about what might happen at the end to look at what happened just before Jesus came the first time. And I want us to imagine now that we could uh, sit in the councils not of heaven but of Satan and think of what was going on there about the last hundred years before Christ was here on this earth and the next hundred years after he was here. And I'm going to suggest that you, if you want to read about this from an inspired source, read the first three chapters of the book Desire of Ages. From those chapters it is clear that Satan believed, literally believed, that he had just about conquered the Jewish people and that he would win the great controversy. This is before Jesus came. Then Jesus was born and we have the story of his life. Satan was certain that he would be able to get Jesus, number one, to sin. And if he could not get Jesus to sin, he would make the life of Jesus so difficult that Jesus would give up and go back to, have, back to heaven and thus break up the plan of salvation. And even after Satan had failed to get Jesus to do either of those things, he, Satan and all his angels, thought that they might be able to keep Jesus in the tomb after he was dead. And they couldn't do that either. So then Satan and his, all, his evil host really believed, as did the Jewish leaders, that once Jesus was dead and buried, his followers would scatter and none, no one would hear from them again. But then came Pentecost. Satan was extremely disappointed, and he used all his energy to try to destroy the new church, both from outside and from inside. Um, Read a couple more verses, what Peter says about that. Verses 10 to 22. Especially, and he's talking about the problems that we have just mentioned. He talks about especially those who follow their filthy bodily lusts and despise God's authority. 
These false teachers are bold and arrogant and show no respect for the glorious beings above. And that's one of the questions I would like to ask you. I want you to think about this. What does it mean to show no respect for the glorious beings above? What do you think he had in mind? Instead, they insulted them. Even the angels, who are so much stronger and mightier than these false teachers, do not accuse them with insults in the presence of the Lord, but these people act by instinct, like wild animals born to be captured and killed. They attack with insults anything they do not understand. They will be destroyed like wild animals, and they will be paid with suffering for the suffering they have caused. Pleasure for them is to do anything in broad daylight that will satisfy their bodily appetites. They are a shame and a disgrace as they join you in your meals, all the while enjoying their deceitful ways. They want to look at nothing but immoral women. Their appetite for sin is never satisfied. They lead weak people into a trap. Their hearts are trained to be greedy. They are under God's curse. They have left the straight path and have lost their way. They have followed the path taken by Balaam, son of Beor, who loved the money he would get for doing wrong and was rebuked for his sin. His donkey spoke with a human voice and stopped the prophet's insane action. These people are like dried up springs, like crowds, clouds blown along by a storm. God has reserved a place for them in the deepest darkness. They make proud and stupid statements and use an immoral bodily lust to trap those who are just beginning to escape from among people who live in error. They promise them freedom while they themselves are slaves of destructive habits. For a person is a slave of anything that has conquered him. If people have escaped from the corrupting forces of the world through their knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and then are again caught and conquered by them, such people are in a worse state at the end than they were at the beginning. And we're going to talk more about that later. It would have been much better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than to know it and then turn away from the sacred command that was given them. What happened to them shows that the Proverbs are true. A dog goes back to what it has vomited and a pig that has been washed goes back to roll in the mud. I think you can tell from those words that Peter felt pretty strongly about what was going on. Um, any, any clues about what kind of things these teachers were, were presenting? Well, possibly they, they weren't relying on the Lord. Mm -hmm. They were kind of relying on their own wisdom. Mm -hmm. it, it sounds like people who have lost their anchor with God turn into these kind of people. I mean, that, that does this kind of um, behavior. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that's the, the crux of everything, is when they lose their way from the Lord, they get separated like from the tree of life. They get separated mm -hmm. from God. Mm -hmm. And they start acting that way. Yeah. Remembering that these people came out of fertility cult religions, out of paganism. Uh, remember that Romanism in, in, in the Roman pantheon, the, their group of gods, and in the Greek pantheon, their group of gods. I mean, they thought that the gods came out of the heavens and stole human women and had sex with them and delivered all kinds of weird beasts. And I mean, they thought that was what gods did. I mean, how would that impact you if you really believe that? Well, the Gnostic heresies were part of the things in that, those yeah. days also. And the Gnostic heresies, what, what would that include? Do you remember? Well, one was that the... Uh, that spirit was good and and uh, the flesh was evil and and uh, that uh, what you did in the flesh didn't really impact what mm -hmm. uh, happened to you spiritually so there was this so there are two extremes as right. you started to mention one of them two extremes in which the people the Gnostics went one extreme was well the body is evil there's nothing you can do about that but just so long as your spirit's right then you can carry on, do whatever sins you want, bodily sins, and, and uh, that's okay. The other extreme was, well, uh, if, if the body is evil, then we need to punish it. We need to, we need to beat it down. We need to starve it. We need to do everything we can to try to minimize. We don't want, wouldn't want anybody to think that we do anything that might be helpful to the body. 
because we're all for the spirit. Um, so those are two extremes that came out of the same kind of thinking. Um, Peter goes on to say these things caused them to make proud and stupid statements. So it's very likely that the warnings in the first few verses of 2 Peter 2, which we recently looked at, were the reason that Peter wrote this book or this letter. Clearly, Peter felt that the church was in serious danger, not only from outside persecution as spelled out in 1 Peter, but also from internal, from internal problems. And we know that he was writing to what group of people? In the church? Okay. Largely Jews. I mean, Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles and Peter to the Jews, but... Uh, there was, okay. of course, clusters of all of uh, both in, in various First, churches, and he mm -hmm. lists actually the whole, was it in per First Peter? Or, yeah, he, or? yeah. He, he, he mentions the, the, the churches scattered across northern, what we would call Turkey today, yeah, those areas, northern and central Turkey. Um, do we find this kind of talking surprising? I mean, look at the leaders of the church in Jesus' day. What was their attitude? They were so sure that they were right. They were so sure that they were descendants of Abraham, that they had a guaranteed ticket into the kingdom. I mean, what could you teach them? They didn't need to be taught, and those were the ones that Satan was sure that he was on the verge of... Winning. Totally winning, and uh, winning the great controversy. Have you ever heard a Seventh-day Adventist preacher or even Adventist member say, we have the truth? Once or twice. It used to be quite common years ago. It used to be quite common. Oh, yes. If the truth really had us, wouldn't we be in the kingdom by now? There's some very interesting passages that uh, we'll look at a little bit later, maybe next week. In the book of Evangelism, 694 to 697, talking about why there's a delay. That'll give you a little clue about some things. So in the in the the, the chapter in the verses 18 and 19 it says they make proud and stupid statements and use immoral bodily lust to trap those who are just beginning to escape from among people who live in error. They promise them freedom, while they themselves are slaves of destructive habits. What kind of freedom do you think they were promising? What does it mean to be free from sin? What does it mean to have the freedom of Christ? Well, they were trying to say you, could, you were free to do whatever you want, mm -hmm. whereas to be free from sin would be uh, that we're free to do the will of God, uh, not our own will. Are we free from sin in our day? I mean, we're surrounded by it. We're almost immersed in it. I mean, you turn on the television, you, 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 you get into the Internet, you drive down the freeway. I mean, you know, it's everywhere. Good thing so, none of us are sinners. Yeah, isn't it? <laughs> well, maybe is that why God chose to have Jesus grow up in Nazareth? So none of us can have an excuse? I mean, imagine, try to imagine this. In our day, let's say the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are sitting down at council and they're saying, okay, Jesus, you're going to go down to this earth. Where's the best place for you to live to teach about the truth? Uh, let's go to Las Vegas. Or San Francisco. Or, or San Los Francisco Angeles, or Los or, Angeles. Or any city. Well, um, Peter talks about what happens if you, if you come out of the false teachings, if you come out of these false pagan ideas and so forth, and you join the Christian church for a period of time, and you fall back. And what does he say about that? It would be better if they had not known the truth at all. How could that be? I mean, at least they have a little bit of the truth, right? 
They've been immunized. They've been immunized, okay. What do you all think? It would be harder for them to respond once they're immunized against the truth. Mm -hmm. And also in the end they'd have greater remorse having a better idea of what the truth was. Okay. There's the, and there's a great temptation just simply to say, well, been there, done that. You know, if you go and try to convince them that they need to, um, to come back. Well, they had heard the truth, but they didn't have the scriptures like we have today. Absolutely. And our excuse today is even worse, I think, because we have the scriptures but we rely on perhaps the preachers to tell us what to believe. And in all the different denominations, that can get quite varied. Yeah. But we're still relying on somebody teaching us instead of the scriptures. There's very little Bible study anymore. Yeah. Well, if you, if you think about Christians in general living in our world today, how much distinction, clear distinction is there between them and the world? Don't everybody speak at once. <laughs> I mean, you know, you take divorce rates. They're the same. You, you, even among pastors, I mean, think of Jimmy Swaggart and people like that, and that story was a long time. And there's a lot of other people in more modern times. I don't even try to keep up with them anymore. People who what? he's alive and well. He still has a TV program. Yeah. Oh yes. Yeah. Well, it comes in a lot of different forms. When you yes. look in the big cities, you you get one aspect of it with all the entertainment of it. Yeah. But you go to a small town, and the message that you're getting there could be just as stinted Might because be. of a paradigm that they're in that they can't get out of. Mm -hmm. Well, think about the Pharisees again. They were sure that they were descendants of Abraham. They were following all the Pharisaical practices. I mean, they had a guaranteed ticket to the kingdom of heaven, right? They thought so. Ellen White says that, Desire of Ages 171. And so Jesus talks to them on that occasion on, in, 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 in uh, John 8, and he says, you need to be set free. And they said, set free? We've never been in bondage. I mean, here they are paying taxes to the Roman government, etc., etc. We've, ne we've never been in slavery to anybody. You know, and then there's the story of e Egypt, and there's the story of Babylon, and... Well, what, what, what problems did Paul warn those same Christian groups about in Romans and Galatians? Do you remember some of those things we're going to be talking about coming up? Well, the Judaizers, those who... Yeah. And what did the Judaizers... What, 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 what's the, what was the distinguishing characteristic of a Judaizer? Circumcision. Okay, well, basically the idea was you really need to be fully a Jew before you can really be a Christian. You need to follow all the Jewish requirements from the Old Testament. And, of course, the big one that they talked about was circumcision. Um, Working your way to heaven yourself, that was still there. Yeah. Yeah. So, could a faithful Seventh-day Adventist be in bondage to sin? Not possible, right? Well, how many of us are more concerned about our situation here on this earth, what people might think about us, how we're going to earn a living, etc., etc., than we do about our preparation for the Kingdom of Heaven? So, if you're if that's your focus, what happens to your thinking? Well, the seed that fell by the side of the road and had uh, weeds and stuff, it, the tears choked out the seed so it was unfruitful. 
Is it possible when Peter wrote this section in his letter, he was thinking about these words from Jesus? When an evil spirit goes out of a person, this is Matthew 12, uh, 43 to 45. When, the, when an evil spirit goes out of a person, it travels over dry country and looking for a place to rest. If it can't find one, it says to itself, I will go back to my house. So it goes back and finds the house empty, clean and all tidy. Then it goes out and brings along seven other spirits, even worse than its, itself, and they come and live there. So when it's all over, that person is in a worse state than he was, than he was at the beginning. This is what will happen to the evil people of this day. Are we going from one evil spirit to seven evil spirits? Well, the intermediate state is swept clean and put in order, but they're empty. So uh, we need to be filled yeah. with, with Christ. We need to be filled with him, not just put away sin. Mm -hmm. What we you need to fill the vacuum. To be sin. We need to to be filled with with the fullness of God. Do sinners um, all have an evil spirit? Well, all these sinners you were talking about. Well, if you're talking about are they completely demon possessed? Of course, we would say no. But are they being practicing evil practices, and are, is that being promoted by the devil himself? And the answer, of course, is yes. Well, I was going back to that mm -hmm. illustration you just yeah. read. Yeah. How would that fit? Well, I mean, let's take some examples. Kids who, who, who spend all their time playing computer games and, all, and they spend all their days, all their time shooting at targets on the, on the TV, on the thing, carry guns to school and shoot their teachers. Do they? It happens. Listen to the radio, listen to your news on TV. And it's been going well, on for a while. Well, it happens a few times. Yeah. Does that mean it happens to everybody? No. It uh, happens to everybody. Yeah. Some are more susceptible than others. Mm -hmm. But we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. So we need to realize that there's always some, some element whether we're trying to do something and Satan is trying to resist us or whether somebody else who doesn't care about Christ has an intent to do something, those evil spirits could grease the wheels, so to speak, and make things easier. Have any of you been aware of, the, of a time when, say, a local church has an evangelistic series and quite a number of people get interested and they come into the church and then you come back a year later and there's one or two left. Why does that happen? I think there's two basic reasons. A lot of, from what I remember, a lot of those series were quick, which on its own is in one way okay, but there's little follow-up. And then people get interested and they're ignored. Mm-hmm. Never form friendships or yeah. get involved with groups and things. Exactly. You, you've talked several times about what retains people in the church. One of them is you believe. Mm -hmm. One is you get involved, mm -hmm. and uh, you have you are associated with uh, with a small group. I think. Yeah. Exactly. I think those were the you three feel, things. You feel close to a group, a small group that are personal friends and so forth. And those are the, you have to have at least, uh, all the research shows you have to have at least two of those three things if you're going to stick around. How you're greeted at the front door. If you're greeted at the front door. Well, that's my point, yes. Yeah. Well, returning to old habits is easy. Especially when your former friends are saying, yeah, oh, you know, you used to do this, what? Come and join us. Um... Could it be true is that... that um, or even worse, other people in the church are still doing those things and then you say, well, maybe they're not so bad after all. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and I, I'm not going to make a list right here, but 
I can think of lots of things that are considered pretty normal behavior today that were regarded as terrible sins when I was a child. Um, and maybe they're not sins, and maybe they were. I don't know. Uh, old habits die hard. And I'm quoting again, this is, time for, this is from an article in the Youth Instructor by Ellen White. We have little idea of the strength that would be ours if we would connect with the source of all strength. We fall into sin again and again and think it must always be so. We cling to our infirmities as if they were something to be proud of. Christ tells us that we must set our face as a flint if we would overcome. He has borne our sins in his own body on the tree, and through the power he has given us, we may resist the world, the flesh, and the devil. Then let us not talk of our weakness and inefficiency, but of Christ and his strength. When we talk of Satan's strength, the enemy fastens his power more firmly upon us. When we talk of the power of the mighty one, the enemy is driven back. As we draw near to God, he draws near to us. Use Instructor, January 4, 1900. And then she goes on in another place, we want all to understand just how the soul is destroyed. It is not that God sends out a decree that man shall not be saved. He does not throw a darkness before the eyes which cannot be penetrated. But man at first resists the motion of the Spirit of God, and having once resisted, it is less difficult to do so the second time, less the third, and far less the fourth. Then comes the harvest to be reaped from the seed of unbelief and resistance. Oh, what a harvest of sinful indulgences is preparing for the sickle. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 120, paragraph 2. Having said all, though, having looked at all those warning words, we all, we all know people who have been out and then have come back. And how does heaven feel about people who have been out and come back? There's rejoices. great rejoicing in heaven. But Peter says if you join the, the faithful and then you go back, it's like a dog returning. Remember the verses we read earlier. Like a dog returning to his vomit or a pig going, just being cleaned off and runs out, runs out and rolls in the mud. Disgusting parallels. Why would Peter use such strong language, do you think? Had strong feelings, strong concern. He felt very, very concerned about what he was going on. Um, so what should we do to help new members become more firmly established in the church and realize how important it is to remain faithful? Make friends. Gordon has already mentioned some of those things that we've talked about before. We need to, we need to root them firmly in the truths of the, of the church. One. Two, we need to become their friends. We need to invite them over to eat with us. We need to, you know, bring them into our family as, as you would, make, make them a family, a part of the family of God. And then get them involved in the church. It's a lot harder to, to say, well, I guess I don't need to go to church today if you're supposed to be deaconing that day or something like that. You know, if you're involved, then you have more of a commitment to, to be there. Um, so we have suggested here, and I'll suggest it again right now, that ideally every member who is baptized should move almost straight away immediately from a baptismal class into a class that takes them through the Bible, book by book, seeing the serious and important questions that are in each one of those, each one of those books and realizing the underlying themes of the Bible, the underlying message of the Bible, and if they make it through that, they will be grounded, I really believe. Is that one time through the Bible? I, what my, my personal experience is you get people who have really stayed all the way through and really enjoyed the Bible, and when they get to Revelation, they say, oh, we've got to start over in Genesis. We can't stop now. Now that you know what's in Revelation, you've got to start over. Yeah, exactly. So if we did that, it would make a huge difference. And I might say at this point in time that um, on our website at theox.org, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, you will find study guides 
for every book of the Bible and teacher's guides where the answers are given for every book of the Bible. Suggested answers. Suggested answers. That's the right, that's the right comment. Uh, and, and the important thing about those questions and answers is not so much the answers as the questions. People need to be challenged to read the Bible and see the questions which it raises that a lot of people would never even think about. So there's a challenge for you. Well, how would you describe the sin or sins of the wicked angels? They don't want to come back to God. Were they guilty of adultery? I don't think that matters. That's, that's what comes up when they don't want to come back to God. Okay. They broke the 11th commandment. Yes. Yeah. The 11th. Whatever is without faith is sin. So, when they... I, it, every time I think about it, it just blows me away to think that people standing basically in the very presence of God would choose to believe Satan instead of God and literally go to war against God. I mean... Well, see, isn't that the process? He's working them to go away from the presence of yeah. God? Yeah. Well, that's, that's what's doing it right there. When you say presence of God, these guys are, if you're in the presence of God, you're okay. It's when you get away from well, the presence well, hold of on. God. I mean, Satan was, he developed his theories, of his, his great rebellion, standing in God's presence. Uh, he's, Read Ellen White. She says that she, he leaves the presence of God. Yeah, after a while, after well, he sort of that, has his ideas, yeah. Well, yeah, but, but as he leaves, they get stronger yeah. and stronger. I, I'm not arguing with that at all. Not arguing with that at all. But, I mean, suppose you're the, you know, the number 25 angel out there that he's trying to influence. And he says something that, you know, that doesn't seem quite right. And you have the option of going and asking God. Is that really the truth? I mean, isn't that what you should do? Is it as easy as that? Why not? Well, it may not be exactly like that. How would it be? I don't, I don't know why it wouldn't be easy to go well, and ask you're, God. You're kinda, kinda you may not, you may not let him, uh, have, have the opportunity to go in the presence of, the, of the, at least the Father. He would do it to, with Yahweh, possibly, and, or Michael, and, and either way. but. Uh, the father who no, no one had ever seen. So uh, there, the freedom that God has grants all of his intelligent creatures seems to know very little limit. Yeah. It's uh, right there in the Garden of Eden, the, the story we start. It, it, the serpent uh, yeah. uh, occupied by the words of the, of the adversary yeah. were uh, two relatively in immature human beings and but but my my and I realize that and I realize the problem that happened there but I would have thought that someone who had lived in God's presence for a long period of time you'd have thought somehow or rather they ought to know better well three and a half years with the disciples then he says I got to go away yeah and if I don't go away I, uh, but if I do go away the, the comforter was going to come it's the words that God in Jesus, he says, the words that I have spoken are going to be your judge. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's so gentle, uh, the, the radio waves or however God communicates through, the pr through prayer and so forth, but it doesn't overwhelm our freedom to choose. Yeah. And uh, that, that balance of freedom and uh, because of love, that's the way God is. And uh, I can't overemphasize that, that how important, at least in my understanding. We know that every breath and every heartbeat only happens because of the power of God. And the adversary going around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Yeah. And like uh, Dennis pointed out, uh, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in the heavenly places. So, uh, so the question that might be raised here, because it's talking about the judgment, we're talking about the judgment, and we need to clear, clearly distinguish between what might appear to be a temporary judgment of someone here on this earth that, whose life may be extinguished temporarily 
versus the, the permanent judgment that happens at the third coming, second and third coming, does God ever take away people's lives? Um, even in the, even the first death, stops, protected them, okay? You bet. He's the creator. God is the creator. He does not have to do things to shorten people's lives or, or the heavenly intelligence's lives. He hasn't apparently done that at all. However, you get to Psalms 82, 7, and he says that those referring to the heavenly intelligences that are uh, the part of the uh, uh, yeah. uh, Revelation 12, 4, that they, they were swept down with, with the uh, tail of the dragon, those are going to die like humans. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, well, for those of you out there who um, might want to pursue this issue in more depth, there's a complete handout on our website at www.theox.org once again, and it's on entitled The Final End of Sin and Sinners, and I have put together uh, about 60 or 70 pages, everything I could find in the Bible and in the Spirit of Prophecy on the final end of sin and sinners. So uh, that... There's a, lot, there's a wealth of information there. It's, it's yeah. well worth uh, yeah. taking advantage of that. Well, one of the interesting things about this particular chapter, and go, spilling over into chapter 3, Second Peter 2 and the first part of chapter 3, there's some very interesting parallels between this and Jude the middle of the book of Jude, which is one chapter, as you know. Uh, do you think uh, Jude borrowed from Peter, or do you think Peter borrowed from Jude? I thought borrowing wasn't, wasn't a good idea. And neither one of them had an original thought. <laughs> <laughs> That's from my years at PUC. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is wild speculation, but John said that uh, there were many other things that Jesus said and done. Maybe they're reflecting on some of the discourses that Jesus gave that weren't recorded in the Gospels. Okay. So Paul brings one up in Acts that, uh, that the Lord said it is more blessed to give than rec to receive, and you don't find that in the, the Gospels, so it's just mm -hmm. one example. Yeah, exactly. Well, um, there's a couple, another possibility that we haven't mentioned yet, and that's that Maybe both of them got this idea from another source that we don't even have available to us now. And wouldn't it be right if, if ultimately the Holy Spirit is the one who's behind all inspired Scripture, wouldn't it be all right for him to say something twice if he needs to emphasize it through two different writers in a slightly different form? Um, look at a couple of places. Look at 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Every test that you have experienced is the kind that normally comes to people. But God keeps his promise and he will not allow you to be tested beyond your own power to remain firm. At the time you are put to the test, he will give you the strength to endure it and so provide you with a way out. Okay? Uh, that's part of what God talks about. And look at Matthew 6, 13. Do not bring us to hard testing in the Lord's Prayer, but keep us safe from the evil one. So, um, there's certainly many, th many stories in the Gospels that are repeated two, three, even four times mm -hmm. for emphasis. Look at a couple of verses specifically. Second Peter 2 verse 12. But these people act by instinct like wild animals born to be captured and killed. They attack with insults anything they do not understand. They will be destroyed like wild animals. Could that be a reference to that some people will not be raised back in the second resurrection? You know, that. Yeah. That what's the purpose? What, what, what do you do with, with a wild animal, you know? You yeah. put them to, out of their existence and uh, you know, some, I don't know, it's just a thought. Jude, Jude puts it in these words, words. These people attack with insults anything they do not understand, and those things that they know by instinct, like wild animals, are the very things that destroy them, which is basically saying the same thing in a little different language. Um, if you've li lived a dissolute life and lost a lot of your brain power as far as figuring yeah. out good and evil, you're going to act like that. Yeah. 
Those, those people, have, you know, it's, it's pretty obvious uh, to anybody that's really serious, does much serious thinking. But the frauds are the ones that are going to be the real, uh, and because you you wonder why do why do they not exist? Well, they you know they were given their tithes and offerings and visiting the poor and the sick, but they were still frauds. Yeah. Well, um, just think about it. What what these verses are saying to us is that you and I by carefully studying scriptures and, and, and filling our minds with the ideas of God, can be transformed into the divine image. Or we can fill our minds with garbage and we'll be turned into vomit. That's what it's saying to us here. That's what it said. Yeah. And of course, that idea is, is, is spoken very clearly in Great Controversy, page 555, paragraph 1. So what is the world filling its mind with in our day? They make, they, Movies the and drugs and murder and it's crime and, and politics. That too. It's, it's all designed to keep people off balance and keep them ignorant. And uh, they become led around like uh, with a ring in their nose. Whatever appeals to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the boastful pride of life yeah. can be from any of those avenues. Well, in our handout, which is available on our website, and if you w would like to get it, um, we don't have time to look at this in detail, but we have, I have put in parallels between what is in 2 Peter 2 and uh, what's in Jude 3. And I notice that I have a typo here. I'm going to fix It's supposed to be 2 Peter. Uh, but you, if you look down through this, you will see they're very careful, very almost word for word in some cases, parallels between what Peter says and what Jude says. And down, it just goes on and on and on. They, sometimes they give different examples. Peter talks about the children of Israel who came out of Egypt with, under God's guidance, but then they rebelled in the desert and died out there. And Jude picks, says something similar, but he uses his illustration is Noah and his family among the people of those days. So, um, both of them talk about the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, Peter says the Lord knows how to rescue godly people from their trials and how to keep the wicked under punishment for the day of judgment. Jude says these people have visions which make them sin against their own bodies. They despise God's authority and insult the glorious beings above. And I'll, you can go ahead, if you just set these two pages side by side, you can run down and see what it says. I'm not going to take time to go all the way through. Um, scholars have looked at these passages and say there's some evidence from the biblical language itself, from the, from the original Greek, to suggest that probably both Peter and Jude borrowed from a third source that probably was inspired, or at least that God considered it to be of uh, reliable nature. Uh, rather than either one of them borrowing from the other. Well, what sources of corruption are entering the minds and lives of Christians in our day? I know we have to get too graphic here, but all you have to do is turn on your TV or watch a movie. Peter talks about shameful things entering into the homes of Christians. When you turn on your television, are you inviting the devil into your home? Maybe. What about the internet? There's more and more stuff coming on about the supernatural. Yeah. Except the common man probably has no idea what this involved with. Well, it's interesting to notice that the sins that are spelled out here are not, you know, people attacking the church from outside, persecution and violence and so forth like that. What we're talking about here is sins that can develop inside the church itself. The story of Sodom and Gomorrah is a, a troubling one. Uh, what do we know about the, Sod the story of Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, the first thing we, the first mention of Sodom and Gomorrah is when Abraham says, you know, to Lot, he says, 
your herdsmen and my herdsmen are fighting over good, the good pasture, pick a spot and you go that direction and I'll stay away, I'll go somewhere else. And what, what did Lot choose? The valley of the city, Sodom. Yes. The, the valley, the Jordan Valley, including the city of Sodom. And we don't know how long it was before he moved into the city itself and raised some of his children there. And then we have the story of three men walking up to Abraham's house in the heat of the day. And Abraham runs out, Whoa, wait, 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 stop and have a meal with me and so forth. And who did he find out later it was? Yahweh and two of his Message. God himself, Jesus himself, and two of his angels. And then they said, okay, we're going to go down there and we're going to destroy those wicked cities. Why would God choose to do that? Think of all the misunderstandings that have come up as a result of that. Why, did, why do you think God did that? Somebody's got to have an idea. Well, I think it's because the, the angels thought it should be done. That's right. Okay. Because if you read it carefully, he says, God says, should I tell him what I'm going to do? Mm -hmm. Like, like um, this is what you want me to do. I'm going to do it. I'm going to tell him what I'm going to do. So, well, that's how I see here's it. A, here's a suggestion out of my study of Scripture. It's maybe a little bit like that. We know that when the children of Israel finally came back to the to to live in the land of Canaan and so forth, it was a very short time before they were corrupted by the people around them. Imagine if the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah had still been there. It would have been even faster. I think God said, these people are the leaders in evil. We, you know, if my children are going to come back and live here someday, I need to do everything I can to keep these, this kind of influence away from here. They could have gotten so bad they could have destroyed themselves by then too. That's also possible. Well, we know what happened to, to Lot's wife. And we know the subsequent stories about Lot's two daughters. They had uh, lived in Sodom and Gomorrah long enough so they figured out something. And we read on and their, their descendants were nothing but trouble. Wouldn't it have been better if God had just not discussed this with Abraham and just eliminated Lot and his family? Well, you go, back, you go to Genesis 19, mm -hmm. and uh, it doesn't say that, that Yahweh it threatened any destruction. Mm -hmm. But Abraham th thought that it was, uh, God was going to do it. But God does not say in, in, that I've found in there that he's going to do it. I take that back as uh, Genesis 18, mm -hmm. not 19. Uh, but it's, it's, it's an implication that God is doing it, but God is, didn't do it. It was the two uh, uh, messengers, two angels or whatever it was that, that went uh, on well, the bottom. Yeah. God didn't stop it, think, but go ahead. Because I think God didn't want it to spread. Yeah. And there was possibility maybe he wanted to make an example. Okay. How much staying power did the ex example have, though? Well. It yeah. does seem to last long, does it? <laughs> no, it sure doesn't. <laughs> yeah, and that's one of the things that we, uh, well, and, and I'm, I'm watching the clock. The character of a rebel. <laughs> yeah, I'm watching the clock. I think we need to move on. I've got a couple more things we need to hit on. Another comment from Ellen White to think about. One thing is certain. Those Seventh-day Adventists who take their stand under Satan's banner will first give up their faith in the warnings and reproofs contained and the testimonies of God's Spirit. Ellen White, letter 156, 1903, written to the man who for years and years was president of Loma Linda University. And then she says elsewhere, a number of years before that, the very last deception of Satan will be to make of none effect the testimony of the Spirit of God. Where there is no vision, the people perish, Proverbs 29, 18. Satan will work ingeniously in different ways and through different agencies to unsettle the confidence of God's remnant people in the, in the true testimony. Um, that was in letter 12, 1890. That was written in the aftermath of the General Conference session of 1888. Well, as we noted earlier, Peter discussed freedom in Christ 
What does freedom in Christ mean? I delight to do thy will, O my God, thy law is within my heart. Probably one of the great relatively or more modern examples of freedom in Christ and how it impacts people's lives is the story of Martin Luther and how he felt after he had a chance to read Romans and really begin to understand it in, in its original context instead of the way it was being taught by the Catholic Church at that point. Um, the idea that somehow or other by penance and by all kinds of stuff you could earn your way into the kingdom. Here's what Ellen White says in another place. The great truth of our entire dependence upon Christ for salvation lies close to the error of presumption. Freedom in Christ is by thousands mistaken for lawlessness. And because Christ came to release us from the condemnation of the law, many declare that the law itself is done away and that those who keep it are fallen from grace. And thus, as truth and error appear so near akin, minds are not guided by the Holy Spirit will, that are not guided by the, Spirit, the Holy Spirit will be led to accept the error and, in so doing, place themselves under the power of Satan's deceptions. And thus, leading people to receive error for truth, Satan is working to secure the homage of the Protestant world. 1893, November 1. Well, we don't know for sure what the false teachings were that Peter was talking about. We've made some suggestions. Revelation tells us that the majority of God's people at the end will belong to a group called Laodiceans. What do we know about Laodiceans? Neither hot nor cold. They're pretty comfortable, aren't they? Pretty comfortable. Well, is the reason the gospel hasn't been finished the fact that the Holy Spirit is slow to do what he wants to do? Not a chance in the world. We're the ones that are holding it up. So why are these counterfeit teachings so popular in Christian churches? Sunday for Sabbath, the immortality of the soul for the true nature of man, cheap grace for true freedom. Once saved, always saved. Once saved, always saved, exactly. So many people feel that the strict teachings of the Bible are a little too tight. We need to loosen up a little bit. And I don't know your experience, but a lot of people agree with them. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for the privilege we have of studying your word and looking at something in a little more depth. We think of the seriousness of our times and all that's happening in the world around us, in our government and in every way around the world. May we be faithful to you as we seek to study your word is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.